It goes like that because I have a um, radio face and a TV voice. <laughs> so, uh, wow, this is uh, actually quite the crowd. Thanks for showing up. Everybody enjoying Oak Table World? Good. Excellent, excellent. Um, I'm Kevin Clausen. Um, I've done a lot of things uh, with Oracle product for a long time, and that's the extent of what I'll say about that. Uh, I was the performance architect in Oracle's development group that produced Exadata. That was for four years. Um, currently, I'm a performance architect and technical director at EMC. I focus on a lot of different things. I have three jobs. Um, but my day job is um, I do performance engineering in a shared nothing MPP database called Greenplum. Uh, so that's the message from your sponsors. Um, I'm also uh, active in the EMC Flash business unit. Uh, and I do a lot of work with non-mechanical storage. So there'll be some topics related to that as we go through here. Um, but I'm an old CPU and platform guy. Uh, dating back to the 90s, optimizing the port of Oracle for Dynex PTX on sequent hardware. Uh, and I learned a little bit about CPU and systems, including NUMA and symmetrical multiprocessing and things of that nature. Um, so you'll tend to get a little reading uh, from that uh, heritage of mine as well. And I think we have 50 minutes, right? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Let's test out uh, the Mac here, see if, it, uh, see if it'll panic like it does every time I use it. <laughs> it's working. Uh, we have to um, introduce the moderators. Uh, there are ground rules for this presentation. The ground rules are, if I say really, really stupid things, like, for instance, a platform that consists of 22 terabytes of flash and 2 terabytes of uh, DRAM, is an in-memory database platform, then the moderators come out. <laughs> Under here. Okay, good. Okay, good. And uh, he has a cohort and they'll both keep me uh, good and honest. What do you think? Okay, we've introduced the moderators. Good. Hopefully they won't start yakking anytime I bump this. No, good. Moving along. Okay, what am I gonna talk about today? Uh, this is a session uh, um, about concepts, um, but there will be a little bit of how-to. Um, there's an overarching motto in what I'm going to say today, and that is, you know, look, use the Oracle database to learn the Oracle database. You'll know what I mean by the time the session is over. If you want to grasp really deep concepts like CPU and memory, you can do that by using the Oracle database. You just have to have the right toolkit. Do you really want to learn Oracle I.O.? If you do, you can actually use the Oracle database to learn Oracle I.O. Man, I'm saying outrageous things already. But you just have to have the right toolkit, and you have to look at things the right way. What if you want to focus with uh, Oracle database on random reads? Or if you only want to torture the database writer on a platform and understand the platform's characteristics for handling nothing more than database writer, but yet you're using the Oracle database. How would you do that? You have, you're obviously, if you're uh, invigorating database writer, you're obviously dirtying blocks. That means you're generating redo. So how could it possibly be that you can um, stress the database writer aspect of Oracle instance, but not log writer? We'll talk about that. Um, or if you just want to drive mostly redo physical I.O., how do you do that? If you want to do all of that, then you have to take some time and explore um, modern platform topics and toolkits like SLOB. Has anybody ever heard of SLOB, the silly little Oracle benchmark? Good. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at different ways to use it to do different things. Because a lot of people think it's only there just to tickle um, your round, brown spinning junk. And it's uh, 
It's not necessarily only for that. Uh, and I will make exceedingly flamboyant assertions. For example, if your platform of choice for Oracle database, um, if, you, if you have the opportunity to um, help aid uh, in your IT purchasing decisions for what platforms to use for Oracle, you have to know whether or not the SGA on your platform can scale cache misses and hits before you even start thinking about physical I.O. Everybody always thinks physical I.O. is a hard problem to solve. It's not. It's very easy to get a lot of physical I.O. now. This is not Y2K. And sure, please, pack all kinds of cores in these CPUs for me, would you? I really like that. More, some is good. Apparently, more must be better. Uh, but we license software by the core. So it probably behooves all of us to know a little bit about CPUs, right? Um, and to that end, um, we can actually look at some freshly audited Oracle TPCC results as a springboard into this topic. Hitting buttons and nothing is happening. Finally, um, that's the wrong slide. No, it is the right slide. Okay, um, I'm brilliant. I have just shown you a um, bar graph with audited TPCC that shows that the latest CPUs are faster than the previous CPUs. And I made all of you walk all the way over here from Oracle Open World to learn that nugget of wisdom. 60% more. That's all you should care about, right? How about this? Time for a flamboyance alert. Well, neither of those Oracle TPCC results used Oracle storage. They didn't use uh, my company's storage, but I find it interesting. They actually used violin memory systems. That's not flamboyant, but this is. These days, Oracle tells you what you don't need, and they tell you that a lot. When Oracle proves to you that you don't need certain technology, believe them. If you can get world record TPCC results with the Oracle database without Oracle storage, they've just proven to you what you don't need. Believe them. Let's get back on track. So the previous slide showed us um, the Ooh, ah, nifty, 60%. We don't license to th by throughput. We license by core. So the other thing I did is I actually set the scale on this correct, and I just chopped it up into how many cores it took to produce the throughput number. So what you actually have here is 12% increase per core from the previous generation Xeons to modern Xeons. That should start making the lights come on, but we're going to dig in. We have to start talking about evolution of performance on Intel Xeon. To do so, you have to understand a little bit of or, uh, Intel terminology. Anybody ever heard the tick-tock strategy? Okay, good. Sandy Bridge, or E5-2600 and 4600, is the third generation of QuickPath interconnect CPUs. And they are begat of the TikTok strategies. It's important to understand this because how are your expectations going to get set if the next CPU comes out and you're bewildered by the words tick and talk and you think that every CPU that comes from Intel must be twice as fast as the previous CPU, right? Isn't that sort of what we all hope? No. The tick in the TikTok is squeezing the die. That gives more real estate for Oracle to do really cool things in silicon. The talk is changing the microarchitecture, which allows Intel to do even more cool things with the die. Perfect example. Uh, Sandy Bridge architecture um, brings PCI controllers directly onto the processor die. That's cool stuff, right? The only reason they were able to put that talk, that microarchitecture change in there, was because the previous tick shrunk the die from 45 nanometers to 32 nanometers, made some room, and then over the next 12 or 18 months, they take advantage of the additional room they created. 
this is how these processors evolve today. Uh, Westmere EP, Xeon 5600, that was a tick because they shrunk the die from the halum from 45 nanometers to 32. Broken record, Kev. And um, Sandy Bridge is yes, microarchitecture. Now that we have a little bit of background on that, we're going to use slob to make some sense of these different Intel processors. Everybody rose their hand about slob, so I'll shut up. But I will have to say a few words about slob to frame what I'm going to dig into. Slob is an Oracle database I.O. generator. I remember when I wrestled in high school, um, the coach um, had metrics for how much you're going to suck on the mat, and it wasn't by watching you wrestle. It was actually by watching how many push-ups you could do. And if you found anybody doing anything other than the push-up, they had to go and run wind sprints up and down stairs. That was punishment. What's this have to do with slob? If you want to know how the Oracle database works, use the Oracle database. Those are the push-ups. Don't go and use something else that looks and smells like the Oracle database. Use the Oracle database. Don't let the wrestling coach make you do wind sprints. Slob is uh, exceedingly simple. It's supposed to be that way. Um, it's nothing more than a work loop. Loops SQL performing either select or update. There's 0% schema contention, cannot happen. And there's no application data sharing, and that's because there are a certain number of slob users. Each uh, have 10,000 rows in a table, and the blocks are forced um, sparse. The idea is, is we're trying to use as little bit of x86 instructions to do as many physical IOs as we can. So if I have to read a block and then go fiddle about in the block and deal with the rows that are in the block, I'm using more CPU per I.O. than I want to use. I want to pound on storage and use as few cycles, and yet it's the Oracle database doing the I.O. So if there's only one block in the row, uh, one row in the block, blah, blah, uh, it's less cycles follow the, uh, following the read. It just goes and plucks out the row. 100% uh, index, uh, index lookups. There's no full scans. They're all DB file sequential reads. Um, actually, somebody who... Uh, adopted slob early on, found a little bit of uh, uh, additional init.ora you know, performance tuning uh, that forced even more sequential reads out of the kit. So if anybody's been following the blog threads, the guys at Pythian use the kit and they've added some value in that regard. So um, it's kind of community. You know, people are doing well with it. Uh, time to deal with my head cold. Bear with me. It's not beer yet. Miserable. Continuing with a few words about slob. <clears throat> slob is an exceedingly powerful self-study kit. What can you self-study? Host CPU and memory and how it scales. Um, attributes like NUMA, SMT, symmetric multi-threading. Everybody knows how SMT works, right? Would you like me to talk about SMT for a moment? SMT. Um, everybody remember a term net burst? And hyper-threading, those were the processors back in the core um, Xeon days. Um, the last processor to have that was um, Conroe Xeons, if I recall correctly. Uh, they dropped it because it didn't work. Um, however, when the Halum came out, uh, they reintroduced, reintroduced um, multi-threading uh, with um, simultaneous multi-threading. Now, when I make funny faces when I say things like simultaneous, it's because I'm about ready to make a joke. With threading, you can't do two things simultaneously. You have two threads that are living inside of a core, and either one's running or, the, or, or not, so that's not simultaneous. I don't, I think words matter. Um, but yeah, let's talk about how it works. Okay, the OS knows if a logical CPU is a thread or not. It's aware of that. What the OS doesn't know is what your process is going to do when it makes you runnable on a thread. It doesn't know if your process will sit there and spin in cache or if it's going to wildly go about across random memory and require loads of memory, which is extremely expensive. 
the one that doesn't touch memory, only touches cache, that never stalls. A stall is when the processor instructions require doing something outside the core and cache. If a process, if an instruction has to load memory, well, then what happens is the memory controller puts that out on the memory bus, or rather the address bus, and so the load and store is already lined up, but the CPU switches to that other processor, to that other process. Now, if you have a process that does nothing but spin in a loop, like, oh, maybe trying to get a spin lock, <laughs> and you have another process that is doing more work than him, like, um, well, maybe doing the work under the spin lock that the other guy wants, what you end up with is as soon as the process that holds the lock needs to stall and load memory, the CPU pushes him to the side and brings on the other process thread who sits there and starts testing for whether or not the spin lock is free. It can't be free because the guy that holds it is off to the side and when you monitor him, he's being shown as running 100%. He's just not getting anything done. So what you don't get out of SMT is 100% improvement. You can't double performance because processes that run inside of threads of a core, they have to share, and the sharing switch happens when they do something off of the processor die. Okay? Any of that make any sense? Okay. Uh, the other thing Slob can do is t uh, give you good, deep SGA understanding. Um, the cool thing is you can use it to compare... Um, Server options, like for instance, how many sockets, numbers of cores in those sockets, and then processor SKUs. Um, anybody know off the top of the head how many Sandy Bridge parts there are? There's about 11 of them. And they, they run the gamut from different power, different number of cores, different cache sizes, and everything. It's very complex, but we're going to make some more sense of it, especially if I hurry up. The thing about slob is you can actually really understand how modern platforms work, behave. Um, to make sense, let's look at a, a peek at the work loop. Um, the metrics for slob is how many iterations of the loop you can do per second, and in aggregate if you're running more than one session. Should make sense. I call them slob ops. Uh, that's the work loop. It's very simple. Every trip through the work loop, um, the slob session picks a random 256 blocks to go and read, and in each of those 256 blocks, there's one row. So the work loop is actually just nibbling on, on 256 rows, and then off he goes again. Okay? So this is um, a really informative graph. You see a lot of graphs that are like this at this uh, convention. I'm actually going to put some data on this one, though. What's it show you? Three generations of QPI. Well, if there's three generations of QPI, everybody knows what's on the left. Nahalem. In the middle is Westmere, and on the right is Sandy Bridge, E5. But I think we should first improve um, the scale, because that's misleading, and then put some, uh, some data on an axis here. Yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> okay. Um, this is three generations. Uh, Nehalem um, 5500 uh, would put us all the way back to about 2008. Okay? So here we are, four years of improvement. And this is with slob. I have enough lab kit. I can do this. So I pulled all these numbers together. And in between um, fits of sneezing and coughing with my head cold, I threw them into this graph. Um, you can do this on your own as well. Um, if you're uh, a part of the team that accepts new hardware. If you learn slob, you can find out quickly whether or not what you're about ready to get is going to suck or not. Because you can do things like the math. Let's go down to throughput per core. Whoa, we need this to be animated. Ready? I'm going to do it this style. Changes the story, doesn't it? Why do I care about per core? Because that's your money. What about the guys in the data center that have to think about getting the juice to the box? See, the other thing you can do is if you know enough about SKUs, 
you can actually start to divide the throughput and give it throughput per watt. Pretty cool stuff. You thought that only engineered systems folks at companies like Oracle could do that. No, you can do it. <laughs> Eek. <laughs> Skews. This is where it gets good. So everybody, wake up, shake it off. Red, uh, Nehalem, blue, Westmere EP, Xeon um, 5600. And then the top five are a buffet line. You can walk through the buffet and take a scoop of four core 130 watt parts, et cetera, et cetera. What you're looking at there is, <laughs> this is Turbo Boost. Anybody know anything about Intel Turbo Boost? Anybody want me to talk a little bit about Turbo Boost? I don't care what you said, I'm gonna talk about Turbo Boost. <laughs> oh, hold it, I heard somebody ne say next slide. Where's the moderator? <laughs> next slide fail. Um, no, what you're looking at here is uh, Turbo Boost is actually really cool stuff as long as you know how it works and don't let it screw you, okay? Because it's very to buy a CPU that favors the workload you run, okay? Sometimes the workload you run is not the design center for the part. And you can see this. These are clock frequencies in gigahertz. What this says is, let's go across the top line because that's the hottest sandy bridge there is, 135 watt part. If you're only busying two sockets, they run at 3,800 uh, megahertz. But if you're running, uh, and okay, so that's two out of eight. That's 25% utilized, 3.8 gigahertz. But you actually start doing something because, gee whiz, you paid for these cores, you're loading some work on them. You get out to eight, and you're dropping down to 3.3 gigahertz. Now, can, uh, everybody put your thinking hat on. What if you're running a workload that busies one socket 75% and the other socket only 25%? That's a bit of nonformity, isn't it? The lucky folks on the other socket are running at 3.6 gigahertz. The guys that are running on the more heavily loaded CPU socket are running at 3.3. Interesting stuff, no? Okay, I think it's interesting. So then you can go down the list and you can say, well, okay, here I have an eight core part, no, 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 not, um, a four core part that is um, 3.5 gigahertz and 3.4 gigahertz across the board. So very little drop no matter what you load on it. That would tend to give you a more favorable uniformity of processing, wouldn't it? Yeah, the problem is it only, ha it only has four cores and it takes 130 watts to do it. So what, what do we have to do? We have to line up slob ops per core for that skew, right? Anybody have any questions about this monkey business? Good, because I have some more to say about it. Do you see the, the 5690 line, 130 watts? It's very uniform, 3.7, and it only dives down to 3.6 when all six cores are fully loaded. The corollary to that in the modern Xeons is up on the, um, go up to the 130 watt line, the 2680 part. Same electricity, but 33% more cores. Look at the hit. At low utilization, you drop from 3.7 gigahertz down to 3.4, and there's a sliding cliff all the way to three, out to 3.1 gigahertz. This is important stuff to know, and I'll show you how it affects performance. Has anybody seen, ever seen any of this kind of junk? Cool, I see some heads up and down, that's good. I call it junk. So we're gonna look at um, price performance at different uh, utilization for a server. There's too much, too much data on here, but we're gonna try to get some information out of it. Okay, so there's four boxes. What I have is on the left is the skew, um, the top bin skew that I had in my lab from the, the Xeon 5600 family. And the only reason it's up there is because that was yesterday, and the ones on the right are the ones that you can actually get today. You can't buy a system. Well, no, Sometimes man bites dog. It's very difficult to find a system that's new from an OEM that, that has Westmere EP in it still, okay? 
So off to the right would be the buffet line you're going through. I want two scoops of 2643 or something like that. Okay? These are slob ops and slob ops per core. Now, this is slob sessions guarantee you a burnt core. So if you see the line up there that has one slob session, that's one core that you're guaranteed is glued to the wall. So on a four core part, that's 25% utilized. Everybody following me where I'm going here? Now if you drop down to, let's say, the two slob sessions, and you go over to the 2643 part, you can see that the slob ops per core is 989. Compare that to a 50% utilization level for an eight core part, it's about 25 to 30% less throughput, right? Take a number like, do I have a mouse pointer on this? Huh, <laughs> that's easier. All right, so you know, let's, let's just focus for a moment here on um, 7,900 slob ops. And go fishing about in the other SKUs and find where 7,900 is, and then do the math for licensing. You see where I go with this kind of stuff? Now the very bottom line is obviously full saturation for any of these SKUs because it's 16 sessions. So it's, you know, that's a 4x overload for Nehalem parts, right, and a 2x overload for Sandy Bridge parts. And they show that, yeah, if you really need to go into the stratosphere to get up into the, oh, let's say, you know, 37,000 slob ops space, uh, well, it certainly, it certainly does better than the top for the four core part, which is only 24,000, right? But depending on whether or not you tend to run your servers 100% glued to the wall or not, allows you to consider some of these things because you license software by the core. Okay? Anybody have any questions about this one? Anybody want a copy of this someday? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what you've got there, thank you, Eric, good question. At 16 slob sessions, these are all two socket boxes, okay? So at 16 on eight core part, that means I have how many, what, what CPU utilization? Take a guess. It's 16 on two eight core parts, so I've only got 16 running, but we were talking about SMT. So when you monitor that system on the very bottom row on the eight core parts, they would actually show you 50% utilization, but you know, the other 50% are just threads. You can usually get about 20, 25% out of those. So the answer to your question is when I run 32 slob users on the eight core parts, I do get more throughput, but they overload the four and six core parts. So it, it would tend to just show a pathology from overload, okay? So, yeah, look, what am, I, what am I saying? I'm saying that if you have more cores, you can get more work done, uh, but it costs, okay? And a lot of people don't know how those costs come in, and that's why we do things like slob ops per core. Do you do any yeah, um, so uh, when we get to Q&A, remind me, I'll pull up uh, the number. Uh, the number for, um, this is all, OS NUMA off, booted that way, because that's generally what Oracle recommends, and I agree because I'm one of the guys that told them to do that. Um, if, you, if you take the eight core parts, however, and you run slob, and you use your own handcrafted NUMA affinity, be it with C groups or with the NUMA CTL command, so you boot the database under NUMA CTL and say to interleave the memory, and then you take your slob sessions and you have 50% of them run under NUMA CTL CPU node bind zero and off they go. And then the other 50% go under CPU socket one and off they go. They tend to have a, a, a higher quality of, of memory locality and they, they pump out about another 11%. And I do have that data. Um, because of the complexities of running with NUMA and the fact that you can end up in memory imbalances and stuff, two socket systems really should be booted with the OS NUMA off or you know, if you have a chance to experiment, go down into the BIOS and say NUMA off. But then the granularity at that point is at the processor cache line, which is 64 bytes. So all of memory is interleaved at 64 byte. Oracle blocks are 8K. 
Oracle lock structures are 120 bytes, you get into some interesting complexity. So I, I prefer the OS NUMA off because the, the granularity for striping then is at the page size, okay? What did he just say? What did he just say? <laughs> okay, so I'm not just gonna sit up here and talk about stuff that you can't have. Nanny, nanny, noo, noo. I'm going to introduce you to turbostat.c. Now, I work for a hardware company, and we don't just take other people's pizza boxes and, and rebrand them. We, we tape out motherboards and make systems. Uh, and we are an ODM, an original design manufacturer of Intel-based servers. One of them is, oh, for instance, Thunder. Um, because of that, we get Intel tools under NDA. Now, I'm gonna show you what turbostat.c can show you, but I'm not even gonna tell you what PTUmon would show you. That was fun. Um, yeah, so when you get the slides, you just go and find this and compile it. Uh, you, you have to compile it for the glibc on the system you wanna run. So if you compile on Sandy Bridge, you're probably gonna be on something like 2618 or 2632. If you take that turbostat.c a dot out over to Nehalem where you're probably old um, OS, you're gonna have to recompile. Am I out of time? Oh God. Let's look at some examples of turbostat.c. Nah. I'm not gonna be done on the next slide. Okay. I've got myself convinced that this part's kinda cool. This is the output from turbostat.c, and you too can have this. It runs just like VMstat or IOStat. It just sits there and spits out tuples to the screen. Uh, this is uh, update frequency of every second. And the cool thing about it is, no matter what system you're on, turbostat.c is smart enough to break it out into columns that show you which package you're on. Everybody knows what the term package is in this context. Intel doesn't call them sockets unless they're talking to dweebs like us or users like us, they call it a package. The reason they call it a package is because there's a lot of things that can go into a socket that's not just a, a processor. You, in, a, in a socket, you can actually put two processors that are glued together, a multi-chip module, uh, as was the case with Clovertown or Harpertown, or will be the case with Haswell. When they come out, uh, 14 nanometer, there'll be two processors glued together and stuck in one socket. So you may have two sockets, but you'll have four NUMA nodes, two levels of NUMA, uh, hierarchy as well. Uh, interesting stuff. Boring. No, sorry. Belt sander drops from the ceiling and grinds me to a fine powder when I get too geeky. Okay, this is two, this is two um, slob sessions. Okay? Um, I'll see if I can't page it down. I used VI once when I was a kid. Okay, what I did, just did is I surfed down into an area of the run that's, you know, I'm guaranteed that everything is steady state. And, you know, and this is like watching paint dry. When you're running slob, it is entirely uniform. There's no blips on the radar. It just rates the CPU until you fall asleep. Uh, and in this context, that's a good thing to say. I'll clean up my vocabulary. Okay, um, they're both fully utilized. You can see that socket zero, core one, and thread one, uh, and all the way down at the bottom there, 1311. Uh, anybody uh, know why I picked those two? S those two cores? Because they're both on different sockets. This means I get, this is the fastest clock frequency I can get from this box because I have one active core on one socket. Remember, the cutoff is always either one or two active cores and then it drops down in clock frequency, right? And look at, look at all the different, under the gigahertz column, look at the different frequencies that are around it. It varies as much as 10 and 15%, yeah? Um, but pretty much what you see here is 3.5 gigahertz. Um, I probably didn't make that number up. Let's look. 3.5, this is a 2680 part. That was a total fail. That was a 2680 part, and we need to go to a different slide. How do I jump to a slide? Who? Yeah, but I want to jump back about five slides. Uh, that's about 20 so far. I'm hitting the arrow. 
I'm doing left and right. Hello, uh, Domino's Pizza? Yeah, uh, large pepperoni. That sucked. I'll tell you what. I'm not going to show you the proof. You're just going to have to take it on the kind of uh, exafaith that we're all so good at. And believe me when I say that it, uh, when you look at this <laughs> presentation, um, do the soundtrack in reverse, sort of like listening to a Led Zeppelin LP back in the day, but watch this going forward. Uh, you'll find that 3.45 is exactly the gigahertz that you're supposed to get when you only have one core on an E52680 part active. This, this is how slob, Oracle code running the slob kit can prove to you whether or not Intel is making this stuff up, is kind of the message. Now, 3.5, that's pretty fast, right? What about when I go to more sessions? Look at the bottom, now I'm at 16 sessions. It was 3.5. What's it now? 2.7. If you pull out the table that shows skew drop off for active core, those are the exact numbers that you should expect to get. The cool thing about this particular thing that's on the screen though, is that you'll notice that every core is clocked up to 3.09, even the ones that don't have anything running on them. Isn't that kind of weird? What's this? Why didn't it drop all the way down to what my CPU governor told it to do, which is 1.2? That's because the stuff that we used to think told the processor what to do doesn't tell the processor what to do anymore. So if you've got a CPU governor and you say your min frequency is 1.2 gigahertz and your max frequency is uh, 3.5, you're asking quite politely, the answer will be, if I wanted you to have more clock frequency, I'd give it to you. So, <laughs> all right. probably another session. I really appreciate uh, your attendance and, and not throwing fruit and allowing Beavis and Butthead to be our moderators today. Thank you.